Swindon has also a deep association with aviation, but with a very long history stretching back around about 110 years. And that's why I've decided to put together a series of a few videos for perhaps more, which will focus uh, on its aviation history. The first part is about its beginning, together with the pre- and post-war uh, events. The second in May will be about uh, the nearby RAF and US Air Force bases and the Concord history, and the final parts will focus on events in the not too distant past associated with Swindon. So, without further ado, let's take a look at the pre- and post-war histories. The first aeroplane to visit Swindon arrived on the 27th of July 1912 and attracted a crowd of 35,000 amazed onlookers. It was a Blériot monoplane that was demonstrated. It is believed that this aircraft was flown in by Herbert Bates, a local person, and that the landing field was on or near the polo ground off Marlborough Road. Few of those could have imagined that. Just a generation later, Swindon folk would find themselves building, modifying, testing, repairing and servicing planes of all shapes and sizes as part of an industry which would help to shape history. One locally built plane would even go on to briefly reclaim the area world speed record. Swindon and its neighbouring villages was the hub of a hastily assembled aircraft industry spread over a number of sites which appeared as if by magic during the Second World War before disappearing, although not quite as quickly, to leave only a few signposts to a remarkable period in the town's history. But it's a chapter from Swindon's history which deserves comparison with Aircraft manufacture in the area was first mooted in 1936 when the Air Ministry, with one eye on Germany's rearmament, started to make plans for shadow sites which would provide backup to the country's leading aircraft factories should they be attacked, and even substitute for them if they were put out of action. By 1938, with war seemingly inevitable, South Marston was chosen as a shadow site because of its good communication links but mostly because it was so close to the large skilled workforce of Swindon's huge GWR factory. With the first planes to be built at South Marston due to be made from wood, the skills of craftsmen from the carriage and wagon shops were to prove vital. Many of the workers arrived via the Swindon and Highworth or Light Railway. This was originally built to take railway employees from the Highworth area to Swindon, but a specially built new branch to South Marston meant that some of these workers would now be going in the opposite direction. Building work on the factory at South Marston began in January 1940, but a hasty change of plan was ordered by government officials when they saw the size of the building that was taking shape. They felt that it presented too big a target to enemy bombers, so units were set up at Sevenhampton and Blunsdon instead. The South Marston factory was ready by the summer of 1940, just as the RAF was about to fight and win the Battle of Britain. First, on August the 14th, four bombs landed harmlessly near Rawton Airfield. Then the following day there were nine more at Stratton, which only succeeded in frightening cattle and creating a few craters in fields. Nine days later, Around a dozen bombs landed in allotments in Shrivingham Road and on the county ground cricket pitch, followed by 50 incendiary bombs at Highworth on September the 26th, which fell on stubble fields and, according to reports, produced the first class firework display. Then, on October the 1st, a single bomb fell in the fields at Coat, killing a cow. None of these raids caused human casualties but that would change dramatically on the night of October the 20th when a chilling prophecy about Swindon's role in the Second World War looked like it was about to come true. This had been predicted. 
Swindon Northern Northern targeted Northern again Northern. until December the 19th when a raid by a lone bomber caused one death in Beatrice Street, but Ipswich Street, which was also hit, escaped with no casualties. If it looked like the onset of Swindon's own version of the Blitz, however, we now know that it was not to be, and although the town had worse to come, it was already clear that, compared with other towns and cities, it was getting off lightly. No one has fully explained why this should be so when the town presented not only a strategic target because of its massive railway works, one of the biggest industrial complexes in the world, but also one that was easy to spot amid the Wiltshire countryside. It was easily within range. Indeed, bombers must have passed over Swindon on their way to wreaking terrible bombardments of Bath and Bristol. Key aircraft manufacturing facilities at South Marston and Sevenhampton and the airfield at Rawton were still more reasons for the Luftwaffe to have our area high on its list of targets. This time it was high summer and three separate attacks raised the death toll from 11 to 48. The first no attack was potentially the most lethal but once again Swindon was lucky as the first significant raid on the railway works which also turned out to be the last, failed. In broad daylight at 6.30am on July the 27th, 1942, the plane swooped low over the town and people standing in a bus queue dived for cover as it bombed and machine gunned the factory's own gas works. But three weeks later, on August the 17th, 1942, came the worst night of bombing the town would ever see. Two separate incidents caused 19 deaths in Ferndale Road and another 10 in Kembury Street. Four people were killed at 475 Ferndale Road, but there were also deaths at other homes too. In Kembury Street, occupants were killed at numbers 6, 10, 11 and 12. Among the dead that night were a mother and her tiny child who was still clasped in her breast and it took several days to remove some of the bodies in Ferndale Road. There were further attacks, though th those resulted in few casualties. The town saw out the last three years of the war peacefully, and its huge works and its remaining houses mercifully and still inextricably untouched by the conflict. The first attack was potentially the most lethal, but once again Swindon was lucky as the first... First South Marston Master had rolled off the production line at South Marston in the spring of 1941 and a year later the factory was turning out nearly 80 a month. At the same time as Masters were being produced at South Marston, the area also found itself helping with the manufacture of other aircraft. Men at Swindon's giant railway works machined 171,000 components and carried out some timber airframe refurbishment for Hawker's Hurricanes, while marine mountings at Rawton and Plessy in Swindon were also involved in producing components for the war effort. The area was also about to put together whole bombers. In August 1940, the Short Brothers Limited factory at Rochester was bombed and put out of action, and when the Belfast factory was also attacked, the Ministry of Aircraft Production, MAP, Switch much of the short sterling manufacturing to the Swindon area. Fuselages were built at Bronsden and fitted out at Sevenhampton, while parts, including wings, were also manufactured in Number 24 shop in Swindon Railway Works and at a garage in the town centre. These parts were all taken to South Marston, which also produced some of the wings for assembly in a new purpose built factory called FS2. Takeoff and landing facilities were also needed for the four engine Stirling, so two 1,000 yard concrete runways were constructed close to the FS2 the site. The first Stirling took off for delivery to the RAF at the beginning of 1942, and soon the factory was completing 16 a month. Between the autumn of 1942 and spring of 1943, however, production of both the Master and the Stirling was wound down. The intention was to produce Lancaster bombers instead, 
that plans were shelved as the factory prepared to play host to the world's most celebrated military aircraft. If you've managed to get this far into the video, well done, thumbs up to you. Well, um, statistics show that probably you're not one of my subscribers. Thank you if you are, of course. I am grateful for every one subscriber that I have. In order to get a notification of future videos that I make, and I, they do come out at least twice a week, subscribe and press on the bell uh, to get notifications. And I want my channel to grow, but without your support, that won't happen. So thank you very much once again, and enjoy the rest of this video. Cheers. First, the factory undertook modification work on US aircraft, but demand for the new generation of Spitfires, the Mark 21, became so great that South Marston turned all of its production facilities over to these most famous of fighters. Much of the workforce received hasty retraining in metal work and as a result, first of all, the factory only carried out modifications on older Spitfires before the first South Marston built Mark 21 was delivered to the RAF just before Christmas 1943. South Marston's role in the Spitfire story, however, was short-lived. The new Spitfire was a high-altitude fighter and, especially with DD on the horizon in the summer of 1944, the situation had moved on. In the end, only 121 Mark 21s were built at South Marston, although another 50 modified Spitfires bound for naval action, which the Royal Navy called Seafires, were also made there. Production of later versions of the Spitfire also continued after the war, before South Marston's last Spitfire, actually a Seafire, was completed in January 1949. In October 1945, Vickers bought the factory and airfield from MAP, it cost them half a million pounds, and the factory's new roles included the modification of planes which had survived the wars in trainers. First, the factory undertook modification work on US aircraft, but demand for the new generation of Spitfires, the Mark 21, became so great that South Marston turned all of its production facilities over to these most famous of fighters. Much of the workforce received hasty retraining in metal work and as a result, first of all, the factory only carried out modifications on older Spitfires before the first South Marston built Mark 21 was delivered to the RAF just before Christmas 1943. South Marston's role in the Spitfire story, however, was short-lived. The new Spitfire was a high-altitude fighter and, especially with DD on the horizon in the summer of 1944, the situation had moved on. In the end, Spitfires also continued to, continued to fly out of South Marston after repairs and modifications, with most of these ending up in foreign air forces. Walrus and Sea Otter amphibians were also refurbished, the former destined to fly the colours of the Netherlands and Argentinian Air Forces, and the latter for civil duties. By the 1950s, the South Marston factory was part of the Vickers Armstrong Aircraft Limited Supermarine Division. Still, the spirit of the Spitfire was proving persistent as production turned to the attacker, a jet version of the Spiteful, which in turn had evolved from the Spitfire. The attacker was the Royal Navy's first jet, jet fighter designed for launching from aircraft carriers and was also used by the Royal Pakistan Air Force. In all, 182 attackers were built at South Marston between 1950 and 1953. Did you know that Swindon built Submarine Swift broke the world speed record? The Submarine Swift was the, an RAF fighter that had evolved from the attacker. The Swift was a single-seat swept-wing fighter powered by a Rolls-Royce Avon Axial Flow turbojet engine. This aircraft was destined for the record books when a South Marston-built Swift F4 WK198 set the world speed record at 736 miles per hour, 
32 miles per hour short of being the first supersonic aircraft over Libya on September the 25th, 1953, a record it held for just eight days. This was the second time that a vehicle made in the Swindon area had held the record. The GWR locomotive, City of Truro, had, having set it at 102.3 miles per hour in 1904. In all, 197 Swiss were manufactured, all of them at South Marston. The factory also produced scimitar jets for the Royal Navy, and it was to be the scimitar that would be the final complete aircraft built on the site in January 1961. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, South Marston produced components for a wide range of other Vickers products and major projects such as Concord, but that will be a story for next time. So we'll be looking at the now defunct bases of RAF Lynham and Rawton and the one to the north of Swindon which is nowadays used as a standby base uh, uh, by the US Air Force and uh, for the International Air Tattoo. That one is kind of operational there. We'll be looking at other airfields in the uh, next edition in August, that is uh, Draycott, Redlands, and the one here is Lower Upham, and there will be another look at uh, South Marston. Um, I forgot to mention that we'll also be looking at the uh, Concord story in this edition as well, which is linked to uh, RAF Fairford. So without further ado, we're going to uh, finish off uh, the historical part of the Concord story and its association with Swindon. Following that uh, will be the Air Force bases of Rawton, Lynham and Fairford. And by the way, I haven't included Bryce Norton or Kemble. Um, they do have some connections with Swindon, but for want of time and space, um, I won't include them in this video. So sit back and enjoy. Swindon had a long association with Concord, beginning with its first ever flight, which brought the first prototype to nearby RAF Fairford, the site of its official test centre, and into our airspace in 1969. In that time, local companies played a huge part in its development, with both Vickers and Plessy challenged with designing, manufacturing, and engineering many of the futuristic parts and electronics the aircraft required. There it became a familiar sight over our skies, as it landed and took off nearly every day during a five-year test programme before finally entering commercial service in 1976, ending a quarter of a century later following the Paris tragedy. Concord was a familiar sight over Swindon, flying above our skies on its way to New York or Washington DC just a few minutes after takeoff. Indeed, the sound reverberated even before it was visible. Interestingly enough, the Concorde followed a conventional traffic lane until it reached RAF Lynham and then diverted to the acceleration point south of Swansea. From Lynham onwards it had its own special tract called Sierra Mike westbound and Sierra November eastbound. RAF Rawton was a Royal Air Force airfield near Swindon. Ministry of Defence aviation activity ceased in 1972. The airfield now belongs to the Science Museum Group and is home to the National Collections Centre, which houses the group's large object storage and library. The airfield opened on the 1st of April 1940 and was used for the assembly and storage of aircraft during the Second World War. Control of RAF Rawton was handed over to the Royal Navy and it became the Royal Naval Aircraft Yard Rawton in 1972. The building of Rawton Airfield was planned before the war began and it was to play a major role in keeping the Allies flying. During the conflict, more than 7,000 aircraft of no less than 62 different flights were modified, serviced or repaired at Rawton's maintenance unit. In 1941, 
Another unit, MU N number 76, was also set up at Rawton to handle the packing of aircraft into huge crates for transport overseas. RAF Rawton was a Royal Air Force airfield near Swindon. Rawton also became the final assembly point in the second half of 1943 for many of the gliders that were to play a key role in the liberation of Europe the following summer. Mosquitoes and more Lancasters made their last flights to Rawton during the 1950s, usually destined for the scrap heap, but one Lancaster, PA-474, came in for an overhaul in 1964 ready to join the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, of which it is still a member. The 1960s even saw work on Westland helicopters at Rawton, but by 1972 its life as a maintenance unit was over. In 2010, Defence Estate stated that the Ministry of Defence still owned some 4.22 hectares of the site, where two linked hangar-type buildings were used by the Directorate of Naval Recruiting. In 2016, a 50 megawatt solar farm was completed on about 67 hectares of the airfield with over 150,000 solar panels. This was a joint project of Public Power Solutions, a commercial arm of Swindon Borough Council and the Science Museum Group. From 2016 to 2019, the series uh, The Grand Tour operated their test track on the north end of the airfield, with the track encircling part of the Science Museum's storage facilities. I go on to uh, RAF Lynham. Uh, let's have a look at this printed photo of a Lockley T-130 Hercules, a nicknamed Fat Albert locally, a familiar sub site above the skies of Swindon and District. As a teenager I was already interested in um, aviations and planes like this were a familiar sight and I would often look up at them in amazement. It was the nickname that local people used with some affection when talking about the Hercules though, um, not myself, um, it was a common sight uh, over the skies of Swindon for 55 years. Well that's a long time isn't it? So. Uh, let's get on and find out about RAF Lynham. RAF Lynham was a Royal Air Force station located about 10 miles southwest of Swindon. The station was the home of all the Lockheed C-130 Hercules transport aircraft of the Royal Air Force before they were relocated to RAF Bryce Norton. RAF Lynham was the Royal Air Force's principal transport hub operating the modern Lockheed Martin C-130J Hercules and the ageing but very adaptable Lockheed C-130K Hercules. The airfield became renowned for being the gateway between the United Kingdom and Afghanistan. The station was also where repatriation of British personnel killed in Iraq and Afghanistan took place. The bodies were transported through the nearby town of Royal Wooden Bassett with crowds lining the streets to pay tribute to the fallen. The station closed on the 31st of December 2012, with the majority of its personnel and other assets having moved to RAF Bryce Norton. On the 31st of May 2011, a parade was held attended by the Princess Royal to mark the departure of the squadrons. The final Hercules left Lynham on the 1st of July 2011. Daily flying operations ceased on the 30th of September 2011. The site is now known as the Ministry of Defence Lynham and is home to the Defence School of Electronic and Mechanical Engineering. The airfield was built in 1939, necessitating the demolition of Lynham Court Manor House, the buildings of Cranley Farm and the village's tennis courts. The airfield itself was initially a grass landing area, although the RAF always planned to lay hard runways. Hangars and other buildings were dispersed around the site to avoid creating one large target for an aerial enemy. The station was opened on the 18th of May 1940 as number 33 maintenance unit with no ceremony and few personnel. Shortly after a single enemy aircraft attacked the station on the 19th of September 1940 dropping bombs before strafing part of the airfield. 
five civilian workmen were killed. Lynham's first runways were constructed during 1940 and 1941, the longest being 1.334 metres, the other 1.080 metres. During the following years, these were both extended, and in 1943, the 1,829 metre north-south runway was opened as well. On the 14th of October 1942, 511 Squadron was formed at RAF Lineham. As the war progressed, it expanded its long-range transport from 6 Squadron RAF. The main runway was extended from 1,800 metres to its present length of 2,390 metres. This necessitated the demolition of two hangars on the north side of the airfield and also the movement of the main gate from the north to the east of the station. 511 Squadron was reformed again at Lynham on the 15th of December 1959 as the second squadron to operate the Britannia on long-range trooping flights. It moved out of RAF Lynham for RAF Bryce Norton in June 1970 as Lynham became the airfield for the newer Lockheed C-130K Hercules. The squadron was disbanded on 6th of January 1976 when it was decided to withdraw in August 1991. RAF Lynham came under the media spotlight when John McCarthy was flown back from his five-year captivity in Lebanon to the Wiltshire base. Other famous names followed through RAF Lynham as they were released, such as Terry Waite and Jackie Mann. RAF Lynham received the first of 25 brand new Lockheed Martin C-130J Hercules on the 23rd of November 1999. The newer J model aircraft worked side by side with 29 refurbished C-130K Hercules flown by 47 Squadron. On the 9th of November 2001, the MOD announced a strategic review of the future roles of RAF Lynham in anticipation of the arrival into RAF service of the Airbus A330 Voyager and the Airbus A400M expected around 2010. At this stage, it was planned that both the C-130K and C-130J fleets would move to Bryce Norton in the summer of 2011, with the closure of Lynham completed by the end of 2012. It was thought unlikely that a further military use would be identified for the site. A parade attended by Princess Anne, the station's honorary air commodore, was held on the 31st of May 2011 to mark the departure of number 24, number 30 and number 47 squadrons. The Douglas Dakota of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight conducted a fly past. By mid-June 2011, around a thousand of Lynham's 3,500 military and civilian personnel were left to complete the closure of the station. The final four Hercules departed Lynham at 10.30 on the 1st of July 2011, conducting a fly past around Wiltshire before heading for their new Oxfordshire home, one of them piloted by the station commander, Group Captain John Gladstone. A ceremony attended by Prince Prime Minister David Cameron was held at Bryce Norton on the 31st of October 2011 to mark the formal transfer of rep repatriations from Lynham. The station's air traffic control unit closed at 0001 hours on the 30th of September 2011, at which point all flying operations ceased. As a result, the RAF Lynham Flying Club moved to Cotswold Airport in Gloucestershire. On 1st of June 2012, an inscribed Portland Stone Memorial, a bench and an oak tree were unveiled on the green within the village of Lynham. The memorial commemorates the RAF's use of the nearby station for over 70 years. A flag lowering ceremony took place on the 17th of December 2012, with Lynham officially closing as an RAF station on the 31st of December 2012. After... RAF Fairford in Gloucestershire, 10 miles north of Swindon, is currently a standby airfield and therefore not in everyday use. Its most prominent use in recent years has been as an airfield for the United States Air Force B-52s during the 2003 Iraq War, Operation Allied Force in 1999 and the first Gulf War in 1991. It is the US Air Force's only European airfield for heavy bombers. 
RAF Fairfield was the only transoceanic abort landing site for NASA's Space Shuttle in the UK. As well as having a sufficiently long runway for a shuttle landing, the runway is 3,046 metres long. RAF Fairfield is also the home of the Royal International Air Tattoo, an annual air display, and is one of the largest air shows in the world, with the 2003 show recognised by the Guinness World Records as the largest military air show ever, with an attendance of 535 aircraft. RAF Fairford was constructed in 1944 to serve as an airfield for British and American troop carriers and gliders for the D-Day invasion of Normandy during World War II. The RAF used it to lift British troops for Operation Market Garden during World War II. In the early years of the Cold War, the British and American governments reached an agreement under which elements of the US Air Force strategic air control would be based in the United Kingdom. In 1948, the Americans occupied RAF stations including Fairford, Bryce Norton and others to build up a deterrent in Europe against the Soviets. In 1950, as a result of the beginning of the Cold War, the airfield was transferred to the United States Air Force for strategic bomber operations. A 3,000 meter runway was constructed for long-range bomber operations. The runway was completed in 1953 and served as a forward airbase for the first Convair B-36 Peacemaker aircraft. The airfield later received B-47s which were maintained as a, at a heightened state of alert because of increased tensions with the Soviet Union. Due to the long runway, Fairford was chosen in 1969 as the British test centre for the Concorde aircraft until 1977. The US Air Force returned with Boeing KC-135 Stratotankers deployed on rotation from the many KC-135 bases in the USA. On the 15th of November 1978, the 11th Strategic Group was activated at RAF Fairford. KC-135 and KC-10 tankers deployed to Fairford supported Operation El Dorado Canyon against Libya in 1986. Due to the RAF Fairford's location and infrastructure, the airfield is designated as a forward operating location for the Air Force of the United States. It was used in the first Gulf War in 1991 with B-52s and KC-135s from Eka AFB in Arkansas. Due to the deteriorating airfield facilities and its unique NATO heavy bomber mission, RAF Airford underwent a $100 million upgrade of its runway and fuel systems in the largest NATO-funded airfield construction project within a NATO country since the end of the Cold War. In 2010, the United States Air Force withdrew all its uniform staff from the station by September 2010, leaving a civilian operating unit to maintain the base on a care and maintenance basis. However, the base remains a designated standby airfield for heavy bomber operations, capable of immediate reactivation within 24 to 48 hours, and it continues to host the Royal International Air to 2 every July. In September 2014, Fairford was used as the staging base for US President Obama's trip to the NATO conference held in Newport, Wales. Air Force One aircraft carrying the President and his entourage and support aircraft arrived on the 3rd of September. The US Secretary of State John Kerry also arrived in his own US Air Force C-32 aircraft. Air Force One with President Obama departing from Washington on the 5th of September after an impromptu visit to Stonehenge on his way to Newport back to RAF Fairford. Hi, I'm John and welcome to Lucky Losers. So welcome to this third and final edition of Swindon in the Air. In the previous two episodes we looked at the history, the beginnings of aviation in Swindon uh, and also its uh, local RAF bases. So 
In today's videos, we're going to look at uh, airfields uh, near to Swindon, and uh, then we'll close with some uh, intriguing snippets plus uh, a little surprise. So, the airfields we're going to look at today are um, just looking at this map are Redlands, um, Draycott and Lower Upham, I think I've got that right, yeah, Lower Upham, all to the south of Swindon, plus we'll be looking at uh, South Marston as well, that's where the Honda site is, uh, as you know Honda is just about to close, so uh, enjoy it, uh, and then I'll be back with a surprise. South Marston Aerodrome, as it was known, functioned from 1940 to 1985, being used for military and civil aviation. Vickers had an important research and development site there, with designers at South Marston pioneering new freeze-drying processes. The site had one more twist up its sleeve, and ensured that South Marston would have a hand in the production of planes, trains and automobiles during its lifetime. For many years, a preserved South Marston built Spitfire was on display outside the Vickers factory. This was a Mark 21 LA226 which returned in 1968, shortly after it was used in the movie Battle of Britain. It remained there until 1984 and is currently stored dismantled in the RAF Museum store at Cosford. In the mid-1980s, Honda bought the site, adapted the runaways to become a test track for cars and made way for its 1.5 million square foot car plant by demolishing the original factory. Fortunately, the old FS2 building remains, providing commercial workshop and warehouse accommodation for one or two other businesses. Although South Marston was the biggest, it was by no means the only wartime and post-war aircraft engineering site in the Swindon area. Redlands Airfield was an unlicensed private grass strip airfield near Womborough, just east of Swindon, which operated from the 1980s until 2019. Redlands Airfield started as a small micro-light club in the 1980s on land which was part of Redlands Farm. Flying ceased after neighbours objected to noise. Then the airfield reopened in July 1998 after being granted planning permission by Swindon Borough Council for a microlight flying club. Operations expanded to include microlight training and, in 2000, skydiving. Lower Upham Airstrip, operated by Upham Aviation, lies adjacent to Lower Upham Farm and is located five miles south of Swindon, near Chiselden and Upborn St George. It opened in the mid-1990s and is still currently in use with two unpaved grass landing surfaces. It is used for general aviation. In 2008, Wilts Flyers held a charity fly-in with 104 visiting aircraft. Where on earth did they park them all? Presumably using one of the runways. In July last year, a small plane crashed. Here is a report of the accident. The pilot was flying G CCFW, a replica war FW190. The skies were clear with bright sunshine and light winds to the southwest. At around 1200 hours, the pilot returned to the airstrip to land on its southerly runway. On landing, the aircraft traveled a short distance when it stopped violently and pitched over on its bank, trapping the pilot. The pilot was removed from the aircraft by emergency services and had suffered serious injuries. The aircraft was damaged extensively and deemed uneconomic to repair. Draycott Aerodrome is located in Chiseldon, Wiltshire, just inside Lynham Zone. It has one grass landing strip located in beautiful countryside. The flight office is situated at the end of the runway and has tea and coffee making facilities and a separate WC. Peter Snipe has kept his aeroplane at Draycott for a number of years and writes, Circuits are not encouraged, but if you have to, do them to the west, it avoids overlying most houses. Owing to the fact that there is chalk under the soil, the grass runway drains well, 
and recover quickly from heavy rain. When arriving at 18, stay clear of the White House, just to the left of the finals, noise abatement, slight dog left required. Both ends of 18 to 36 have dead trees, so slight dog legs are required. Be aware that Lower Upham is very close by to the east and they operate on safety com. And the East West Runway is no longer in use. Model aircraft flying takes place on the airfield a quarter of a mile. held up traffic in Swindon on its last journey to Kemble. Well, not literally. It was part of an abnormal load. The Boeing 727 aircraft fuselage was being escorted by Wiltshire Police on a Sunday morning on its way to Cotswold Airport to be reassembled by Air Salvage International for corporate ground use. The convoy travelled along the M4 to Junction 15 before heading a uh, travelling northbound on the A419 to Kemble. <laughs> one soars over Swindon as Obama flies into RAF Fairford. That was in the local headlines back in September 2014. It's not every day that you can say the President of the United States was just over. But thousands could say just that as Barack Obama's presidential jets swoop low over Swindon's rooftops. The Boeing VC-25 was en route to RAF Fairford, with the President being one of the key attendees at the two-day NATO summit in Newport Gwent. Amidst tight security, hundreds of aviation enthusiasts congregated outside the Gloucestershire military base, hoping to catch a glimpse of the President's arrival and their patience was rewarded shortly before 7pm. And it's thanks to a local photographer who was just in the right spot to capture the moment as Air Force One made its final descent. The President didn't hang on about for a long though. He was soon whisked off to Wales aboard the presidential helicopter Marine One. The C-130 Hercules were on the move within a week of each other back in 2011. Travelling from RAF Lynham, the load was transported on the A3102 in convoy through Wootton Bassett to the M4 Junction 16 before heading westbound on its journey to Hickson in Staffordshire. For a plane used to a cruising speed in excess of 300 miles per hour, it was quite a shock to see a Hercules C-130 passing through near Swindon by road at 10 miles per hour. The Fat Albert was on the move from RAF Lynham to Hickson Airfield via special transporter as the base prepared to wind down operations and close back in 2012. Swindon in the air. I hope you enjoy the whole series. Uh, I will put them all together uh, to form one video in the future, somewhere around October, November. Um, and the next part of uh, Swindon's transport history will be looking at the railway history of Swindon. That will be in a few episodes coming in September. And if you're still interested in things Swindon, uh, my channel also runs um, a series of episodes about the politics of Swindon, uh, Swindon Town, A to Z, goals, and coming in August, the beginning of the Seven Wonders of Swindon, and I'll also be planning some episodes on Swindon churches. So that's it. So thank you once again for staying with me. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers for now. Bye.